finally tonight, a new memorial honoring Martin Luther King. Hurricane, I Hurricane Irene may have postponed this weekend's dedication ceremony, but the public is already getting a first look. Ari Srinivasan has the story. Does I have a dream? That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. His words inspired millions and promoted nonviolence in America's civil rights struggle. And this week, 48 years since he delivered his famous speech on Washington's National Mall, the new monument honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. opened to the public. Look at this. This is what he, his dream was. Look at all the nationalities that are here today. I think it's a nice combination of um, thoughtful, peaceful, but strong. I, I liked how it's presented. David Martin brought his children. And it was just the opportunity to bring them here. You know, every night we say our prayers and we're thankful for the things that we've gotten. And those are on the, on the backs of those who have uh, sacrificed, and Dr. King was one among many. For some, the memorial brought tears. It's almost like when I turned the, the corner, it was like, I don't know, such a, a warm feeling, but it feels like it did when you were a teenager and you were marching and you were, you were protesting and you were being taught by your parents to stand up for what was right. The site is a four-acre plot of land adjacent to the tidal basin between the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials. Two huge granite stones at the entrance form a mountain, a vision taken straight from Dr. King's words. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. The stone of hope is there too, in the form of a 30-foot sculpture of King. 14 quotes from King's speeches, sermons, and writings are etched into a 450-foot-long wall. You can walk the wall and you actually get a sense of, is he still talking in 1960 or is he talking in 2011? Harry Johnson is president and CEO of the Memorial Foundation and spearheaded the $120 million project, funded mostly with private money. I think we all walk away saying this is so relevant today because we actually can live, see, and place Dr. King in his proper perspective that these words have meaning now. The idea for a monument to King was originally proposed in 1984 by his college fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha. A dozen years of lobbying later, Congress passed a joint resolution in 1996 authorizing the group to move forward. President Clinton signed the legislation and a decade later spoke at the ceremonial groundbreaking in 2006. The monument, however beautiful it turns out to be, will be but a physical manifestation of the monument already constructed in the lives and hearts of millions of Americans who are more just, more decent, more successful, more perfect because he lived. Even its address, 1964 Independence Avenue, is symbolic. 1964 is the year President Johnson signed the civil rights legislation, with King standing alongside. To stand in front of that monument is to face a movement. It is to, to feel the, the power and the possibility of change. Janetta Cole is director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. She said the memorial will allow the country to revisit King's message and thinks the portrayal in stone is fitting. Certainly for me, it is significant that Dr. King, in a sense, rises out of a rock. He is solid. He is unshakable in his commitment to nonviolence and his insistence on change. From conception to completion, this quiet spot for reflection of Dr. King's life and works has been controversial. Everything from the location of the memorial to the design to the sculptor has been debated. After a long planning, design, and selection process, Lei Yixin of China was selected as the sculptor, leaving some unhappy that the committee had not chosen an African-American. 
But this week at the memorial's opening, Lay told us he had struggled with class discrimination in his own impoverished life and understood King's vision. When I was doing this sculpture, I felt that I had the same ideology as Dr. King. Equality is the priority. We can't choose what we are born to be, but I truly agree with Dr. King's concept. Everyone is born equally. Some say King would be pleased his sculptor is from another part of the globe. Reverend Jesse Jackson. Dr. King was a globalist. The fact that the sculptor is from China, in the real world, half, all human, half of all human beings are Asian, half are Chinese. That would impress him uh, because he saw the world through a door, not through a keyhole. Jackson, a civil rights activist, was a close friend of King's. He would appreciate the gesture. If there were any modification, it may be, as opposed to having just him alone, it may be him embracing a multiracial, multicultural family. But these kinds of difficulties go with the territory when it comes to memorials anywhere, according to Kirk Savage, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh and author of Monument Wars, a book about memorials and the National Mall. The monument to Robert E. Lee, which we'll say is a kind of opposite monument, right, <laughs> uh, was, was carved by a Frenchman, uh, not a Virginian, and that caused a lot of controversy at the time, in you know, the 1880s and 90s when it was built. There have been major disputes over, you know, the Washington Monument itself took over 50 years to build. There were uh, in incredible problems and with that particular, with that project. What? Um, um, well, because, because of its scale, of its form, nobody really wanted an obelisk. <laughs> Another debate adding to the fray, King's expression. Some have said he looks too stern and that his arms shouldn't have been crossed. But the foundation said Lay was thorough. He spent many days in his studio with walls covered in photographs of King to get a sense of his spirit. Lay spoke at Monday's opening. I tried to convey Martin Luther King's passion through his eyes, facial expression, and stance at this work, a passion that encourages people's hope for the future. Art critic Philip Kennicott of the Washington Post called it a mishmash, stuck uncomfortably between the conceptual and literal, focused on the anodyne pre-1965 King. But Jesse Jackson said King's likeness in stone captures the full dimension of the man he knew. He comes to us not just as a poet that was poetic, he comes to us not just as a philosopher that he was philosophical, he comes to us as a man who's serious about the business. And so often I saw him in that, in that pose as he was pondering what were the next steps in the struggle. Whether the memorial brings in as many visitors as other monuments on the mall or becomes as big of a landmark is unknown. But as Kirk Savage pointed out, the memorial already represents a profound change to the mall. Because this is a, an area of the mall that is dominated by war memorials and wartime presidents. And here we have a monument to a figure who, in fact, did, you know, really did try to promote peace and got the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Many hope the memorial inspires action. My fear is that men will read his poetic words and would think more of poetry than policy. So we have to do his unfinished business, fighting poverty, illiteracy, disease, ending unnecessary wars, and using more mines and less missile to make the world better. I've always felt if we are to honor him, if we are to celebrate him, then we do it not by our words, but by our actions. With the dedication delayed, in the meantime, the public can now visit a memorial that's been 27 years in the making.